Straits of Dover, no wider than the St. Lawrence, no wider than the Mississippi. On one side, the greatest machine of conquest of all time. On the other, the white ramparts of Britain. On this narrow strip of water, the eyes of the whole British Commonwealth are fixed. World history may soon be shaped here. Around this island fortress of Britain, they have built a wall of steel. Night and day, the watching eyes gaze seaward. None can say when the hour of invasion may come. Come, they believe it will. Behind the armored shorelines, 40 million people are at the battle stations. These are Britain's craftsmen, the steel puddlers, foundrymen, machinists, the men and women who in time of peace made England rich and strong. And they it is who have brought about the silent wartime revolution, which demands that nothing shall hinder the fulfillment of the nation's needs. Willingly, they have faced the sacrifices, discomfort, hard rations, long hours. For they know that the hosts across the sea are massing. Every hour, it's precious. Germany did not start its war. The British wanted war, even though they knew their cities would be reduced to ruins. The power of England will be annihilated. The scourge of modern weapons will be turned against her and will ravage her territories and her people. Already her southern towns are receiving the baptism of fire from our long-range guns. The role of England is to be a vassal state in our new European order. Britain and her commonwealth will be ruled by blood and iron and force. Soldiers of the night, your hour is approaching. usually hear Jerry leaving the other side. We watch out for him. And as for the shells, well, we see a flash. Count 60. There she is. It was just such people as these who bore the full brunt of the first German onslaught on England. The all-out air attack of September 1940. From airfields all along the conquered coasts of Europe, Wave on wave of Goering's bombers launched their long-awaited assault on England. Their tactic? To drive the RAF from British skies, to spread civilian panic, prepare the way for the invading army. So across the fields of Kent and Sussex, across the rolling downs of Hampshire and the sprawling mass of London, the Battle of Britain began. The first great decisive battle in history in which the frontline fighters were airmen and civilians. fateful autumn days of 1940, when none knew what terror the skies might hold, there appeared from end to end of Britain the strangest fighting force the world has ever seen. An army of citizens, self-organized, self-disciplined. Their armament? Hoses, stirrup pumps, sandbags, brooms and buckets. Their purpose? To save their town, their city, their community from the fate of Rotterdam and Warsaw. And even before the droning engines of the Luftwaffe heralded the first mass attacks, this people's army of Britain stood ready. Over the shores of Kent they came, over the beaches of Sussex and the flats of the Thames estuary. A hundred, a hundred and fifty, two hundred at a time, with their cargoes of bomb and fire and their fighter escorts massed around them. These 
raiders were the elite of the German Air Force, groomed for victory. Their Hankels had thundered over Poland, their Dorniers had blasted Holland, their Stukas had shattered the army of France. Only Britain remained. Today, her seaports would lie in ruins. Tomorrow, Birmingham, Coventry, and the smoky towns of Lancashire. Within a week, London itself would be a heap of brick and rubble. to reckon with the RAF. Long will England remember the days when the Spitfires and the Hurricanes first roared in and the fortunes of war were written in white trails of vapor in the sky. As the German formation scattered before the fighters' guns, the radio reports blotted out space and time, intercepting over Norwich, brought down at Calais, engaging at Portsmouth, destroyed at Ostend, and over the radio, too, the repeated warning cry of the Germans to their hard-pressed comrades, Achtung, Spitzfeuer! of 2,400 German aircraft lay on the fields and shores of Britain. They had failed to reckon with the RAF above. They had failed to reckon with the character of the People's Army below. Well, we've pulled more cherries out of the drink than all of them there existed. A crack, trap ones, thin ones, small ones, You'd be surprised. We're getting proper fed up with it. Far more serious to the Nazi high command than the loss of planes and men in that first battle of Britain is the rising tide of help which ever since those perilous days has flowed in from the New World. In these bomber-laden ships, eastward bound from Canada and the USA, lies a threat not only to Hitler's campaign against the British Isles, but to his grip on Europe itself. Today, the leaders of Germany well know that unless that sea supply line can be swiftly cut, all the triumphs of their armies will have been in vain. Every ship that steams in front of our torpedo tubes will henceforth be sunk at sight. In shipyards throughout the Reich, the U-boats go down the slipways, fast, heavily armed, ocean-going submarines capable of cruising 6,000 miles in the heavy swells of the Atlantic. In special schools, young Germans learn the raiders' tactic of hit and run. Not for them to heed the warning upon turpits that Germany has never understood the sea. And so, far out in the gray Atlantic, the Nazis play their second card. If we cannot bomb them out, then we will starve them out. From bases along the western coast of France, the big Pucker Wolf bombers range far and wide across the ocean, seeking out the convoys approaching British shores. A rapid inspection from low altitude and the radios begin to speak. Air reconnaissance calling U-55. Air reconnaissance calling U-55. Eastbound British convoy, located latitude 53.30, longitude 17.10. Attack with torpedoes.
off the coasts of Ireland, along the vital westerly approaches to the British Isles, the U-boats lie in waiting. Four, 